How big is it? Farther than we can reach, huh? Yeah, far as the east, the west is from the east. It's huge. And, and if someone came up to you and asked you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the roving mic thing here. I'm, gonna, I'm just literally going to do this because I heard him pray that, and I was impressed that we need to do this for a few minutes here this morning. If someone were to come up and ask you, can you tell me what the gospel is? Uh, I, I've heard there's something called the gospel. Well, can you tell me what the gospel is? How many of you are brave enough to speak into this mic and tell us what you would say if someone asked you what is the gospel? Can you tell me what the gospel is? Anybody going to do that this morning? I mean, it's huge. It's a lot more than one thing, but it, it's, a, it's, yeah, here you go. Well, God came to earth, became man. He lived a sinless life. He had <clears throat> died a very bad death and, and was resurrected. And through his blood, we are saved. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's a strong presentation of what the gospel is. I would only add three words to that. We'll see if they come out here somewhere. Do you, Ellen? Say it. Jesus loves you. Is that good news? Is that gospel? Is that good news? Is it true? Is it, is it, does it draw people? Does it win people to God? Yes, Jesus loves you. Those weren't the three words I was thinking of, but they, it should have been. I should have been thinking about those three words. That's definitely in the gospel. I was in the context of what things he was saying, and I'm going to read the scripture in a minute, and you'll see where I'm coming from. Maybe getting it right here. Hold on. What are you going to say? That we are sinners and that he died for us. He shed his blood for us so we could live with him forever. Yeah. That's so close, it's like burning up the place, man. There's, a, there's one word there that still goes, when I read it in a few minutes, you'll see what I'm talking about. Huh? Believe. He died for us, she said. That was so close. He died for us was so close. Just died for us was so good. That we have something to look forward to, which is heaven, and to be with our Jesus Christ. Uh, is, that, is that good news? Is that gospel? Amen. See, it's hard to, it's hard to miss this. You're going to get it. If you say anything about Jesus, it's all gospel, right? It's good news. Anything about Jesus is good news. Can you say amen to that? And so that's gospel. But it was a, there's a particular thing. Esper and, and Robin and Esper got really close, but there's one more word I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, Charlie, do we have somebody back there? Yeah, let me go back there, Charlie, to Loretta. Loretta is uh, Loretta Young's niece, I think. Now, maybe not related, but she's got that beautiful name, Loretta. John 3.16 actually says it all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. Amen. And, and, and I think Robin said that. Several people have said God so loved the world that he gave. That he gave. That's good. That's good. And is that gospel? That's good news, right? Someone else, anything else you want to add to it? The gospel is huge. It's very big. God became a man. We have forgiveness of sins through the redemption of his blood. That's, that's the rest of that. Well, so, yeah. And, and let's look at this. 1 Corinthians 15. It's really important. But all these other things are gospel. It's all the gospel. Anything about Jesus is the gospel. It was just a certain thing I was looking for where it actually says the gospel. And then he says what it was that he started with when he preached the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. So he's, this is the most clearest where Paul starts with something and he's building a big house of the gospel because the house is huge. The gospel is huge. But he starts with this. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which, in which you stand, by which also you are saved. He's still saying things about the gospel. It's gospel that we are saved. That's good news. If you hold fast, if you hold tightly, to that word which I preached to you. He's still talking about what he preached. I preached to you the gospel. He's getting ready to tell him. Uh, he's getting ready to begin really unfolding what it is. 
unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, the first part, what he considered to be the first prime part of the gospel is getting ready to be unfolded here. First of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. It's good news that the Creator of the universe would die for us. Die for our sins. And he, so he's, he's, and then he's going to, you know, he spent his whole life telling us what the, there's, John 3.16 is a major cornerstone of the gospel. First, First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. And then it goes on. And he was buried, and he rose again. That's good news, folks. That's part of the gospel. Somebody said that a while ago. That he died and rose from the grave. He died for our sins. He didn't just die. He died for our sins. And I was, I was looking. Those are the three words. Died. No, for our sins. Somebody said he died. Nobody said for our sins. And I was looking for those three words. For our sins. There was, there was no one else who could. Except Jesus. He's the only one who could do that. And the, the good news is. Jesus Christ died for your sins because John 3.16. Because the Godhead, all three of them, love us more than life itself. So people need to know Jesus died for your sins. And just trust the Holy Spirit to back you up when you say it. Say it as humbly and, and, and tenderly and, and skillfully as God will empower you to do it. But when you get that chance, just say, D do you know Jesus died for your sins? Make it personal. Very few people have ever had anyone tell them, Jesus Christ died for your sins. A lot of people have heard a lot of things about Jesus, and it's all good news. It's all part of the gospel. The fact that we have a creator, that's good news. We're not, just, we're not just evolved from blobs and going back to blobs. We, we, that didn't happen. We have a creator. That's gospel. That's good news. So anything you can say about God is good news. But Paul says he was arguably the greatest preacher that ever lived. And Paul said that his first, the beginning of his gospel, Jesus Christ, died for your sins. That's what he liked to begin with. He said, I come to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And why? And, and, it, and, it, to pre he, and he said, I come to preach the cross. I come to declare the cross. And that was his first and, and foremost important message to make sure people knew. Jesus didn't just die. He died for you. Because he loves you more than life itself. And he rose from the dead. That was a shocker. The, the people in Athens and the Greek philosophers, that blew them away. They said, this man's crazy. And the other one said, we will hear you again. And many of them believed, it says in the book of Acts. He kept, he kept reasoning with them. And they kept coming. And a lot of them got baptized. So that's what I wanted to share. You just stirred me up when you prayed that, uh, Olin. I appreciate you praying that. So that, that brings us to why are Christians so dangerous? That's a loaded question. <clears throat> I saw this week where in India, a major Hindu reformer, a major national leader is calling upon the Hindus to kill Christians. And he's even, they're even tricking, tricking them. And they're, they're accusing Christians of forcing people to follow Jesus. And they're not doing that. That's not how, maybe there may be some parents that are forcing their children to go to church or something. I don't know. But, I mean, that's just not happening. There's a great revival over there. Many people are coming to Christ because of his love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his healing grace. But this leading Hindu in, in India is calling for Hindus to kill Christians. Publicly. He's not doing this behind the scenes. He's announcing this in the public, and he's not even, they're not even slowing him down. 
it's a pretty sad time in a lot of places. And so, we, you know, they're killing Christians in Iran and in places like Afghanistan uh, now. More, more. They, I, think, I don't think they ever really quit killing Christians in Afghanistan, but now that our American troops have, have left, and I'm not debating the right or wrong of whether they should be there or shouldn't be there. I'm just telling you the fact is there's a lot more Christians being killed right now in Afghanistan. Just Christians. Just because they're following Jesus. Just because they tell people that God loves you so much he died for your sins. That's it. That's all you have to do to get killed in places like that. Uh, it's pretty sad. So I'm, I'm just the question came to my mind, well, then why are Christians so dangerous if they think they've got to just kill them? Well, let's take a look at it. Revelation 2, we're going on with these seven churches. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. That's the second time in the book of Revelation Jesus is saying, I was dead and now I'm alive. And I believe him. I believe Jesus. I choose to believe Jesus. And, and, and to be in the, in the group for the last 2,000 years who have believed that Jesus is alive. He, he, he died for our sins, but he's risen from the dead. I choose to stand with that group. And it's a great host. It's a great uh, who's who. It's awesome. And I know your works, he says. I know your struggles. I know your works in your tribulation and your poverty but he's but he's saying but you are rich you may not have the things of this life but you are wealthy you own the universe because you are my co-inheritor if you put your trust in Jesus if you give your life to Jesus he makes you his co-inheritor that means anything he inherits you do too it's like unbelievable but it's so true that you can't believe it. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Wow. They'd kill him today. If he was preaching like that in the public today, they'd at least throw him in jail or sue him or fine him or something. And, you know, they'd get angry. This is not politically correct, by the way, in our country anymore. To be able to tell the truth. Jesus told the truth, and that's what got him crucified. They asked him, Who are you? And he said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Blasphemy. If a human being claims to be God, they kill you in, in, in those days, in 2,000 years ago, they would, they would stone you for, for blasphemy. Because how could he be God? Because God's in heaven and you're standing right in front of me and I know your, your, your mother, but I don't even know who your daddy is. They actually talked to him that way. They accused him of being an illegitimate child in public. But Jesus is the Lamb of God. I mean, he chose to come here. And so when you tell people that Jesus is the gift of the Godhead, the gift of the Father, the gift of the Godhead to save you and to die for your sins. You're going to be attacked. You're dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. You become very dangerous to anyone who is following or, or allowing themselves to be used and manipulated by the powers of darkness. Um, it's like... Um, amazing when you start talking and, and you know you can say God a lot and get away with it in our society but you start saying Jesus you better you better be ready for repercussions and um, it's an interesting time very interesting time and he says uh, they are of the synagogue of Satan I remember when I the first day Jewish person I ever met and who knows he may be watching this I don't know his name is Jay Klein and I was wanting to go down from uh, north of Denver 
I was wanting to go all the way down to Austin, Texas for Thanksgiving. I met a girl there after our football game with the University of Texas. We played the University of Texas there in Austin. And, and after the game, I was just hanging outside the stadium there, and there was a bunch of young college kids walking around. And, and I wasn't dating anyone at the time, and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to maybe see what may be available for an eligible bachelor like myself. So I started talking to this young lady and her friends, and things kind of gelled pretty good. And I got her phone number and her address. That's what you do. You guys need to be taking notes if you're single. You need to, you need to get their phone number and their address. And, and so I did that. And I just was nice. And, I, and I'd just become a Christian. I was a baby Christian, but I was a Christian. And I told her that I was a Christian. And, and she said, oh, that's great. I am too. And Wow, cool. You know, we thought that was awesome. And so I, I went all the way back. I got the ride down from uh, Colorado State University north of Denver. I got the ride with Jay Klein in his van his conversion band, you know, it was a nice conversion band, and, and I got that, I put it up on the bulletin board at the college, that's what you did if you didn't have a car, you put up, I need a ride, and I actually had a car, but I didn't have the money to put the gas that it would take to get to Austin in my car, so I put that up there, and he called, yeah, we're going down there, we'll give you a ride, he said, but you'll have to find your own way back, or, oh, no, 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 he said, yeah, 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 but I'm coming back on this, that's fine, I'll ride back with you guys, too, so, okay, we get down there. Can you imagine her parents when I showed up in Austin, Texas, and she was still living at home, and, and she told them about me coming. They did not like it when I got there. And for some reason, when they saw me, they didn't like it. And, and, then, and then when I, we had dinner that evening, I started telling them about Jesus, and they really didn't like my style of witnessing because I, I probably wouldn't like it now either, but I was a little... I mean, if you think I'm heavy-handed now, I was really heavy-handed back there. I'm just blowing with both barrels, boom, 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 you know, right at the dinner table, and that kind of freaked them out. So they cut short my visit. Uh, it was a one-night visit, and it wasn't even Thanksgiving yet. And so <laughs> I was supposed to stay there five nights because I was going to ride back with Jay Klein. And, and, and so that set in motion one of the most exciting trips of my whole life because I did have $100, and I, did, I could have bought a bus ticket and taken it back, or I could have just found somewhere to hang out in Austin until Jay Klein and his buddies were going back. And I said, you know what? God did this, and God's going to have to take care of me now because... I, I just was obeying him. I was telling people the gospel, and I, now I'm in trouble. So we, uh, I, I went out hitchhiking. I said, I'm not going to spend that $100. I'm going to hitchhike, and everybody who picks me up is going to hear about Jesus. They're going to hear the gospel. And I told her, I said, I will tell them the gospel. Anybody who picks me up is going to hear the gospel. So, Lord, you choose who, you want them to, who do you want to pick me up. I started out, it was about 80 degrees in Austin. By the time I got to Oklahoma City, it was about 28 degrees, and I was in the middle of one of the biggest blizzards Oklahoma, ever, Oklahoma City ever had at Thanksgiving time, and I was on the freeway going through Oklahoma City. I'd come up on the 35 interstate, and I was going west, west on the 40, but it took me four hours hitchhiking through Oklahoma City in that blizzard, and all I had on was a thin leather coat. And I was praying, Lord, I told you, I, 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 I could have gone down and done something else. I said, no, I'm, like, I'm staying up here. No gloves. And it was bitter cold and freezing. No hat, just a little thin leather jacket and a little bag, a, a suitcase type thing. And nobody would pick me up. And I was praying like crazy. I was praying like crazy. And finally, a guy picked me up. I don't know how long I've been walking, but I know it took me four hours to get all the way through Oklahoma City. And uh, he pulls up in a nice warm truck, and I jumped in. And I said, hey, man, thanks a lot. It's cold out there. We're going. We just took off down the road. He says, yeah. He says, he says uh, actually, it's too cold out here. You, you want a place to stay? You can stay with us. You can stay at my house. And, and I thought, oh, wow, that's going to be awesome. 
He's probably got a family. I'm going to go home and meet his family. I'm going to tell them all about Jesus. I'm going to invite them to give their life to Jesus. Man, I was already planning. I was already planning. And, but then there was something, this little catch just caught me a little bit too. Uh, well, I better ask. So I said, so, well, yeah, well, what, exactly what does that mean? What do you mean stay the night? Blah, blah, blah. He says, well, he says, he says, I've got some really good uh, drugs, and i got some really good alcohol, and, and, uh, and you and I can have a wonderful time making love. And I, that's where I thought this little boy from Hooker, Oklahoma, just got into the wrong vehicle. But I didn't. I didn't follow that lead. I just followed the Holy Spirit's lead. And he said, so what do you say? You, 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 you in for some fun or you in for that kind of thing? And I just, I was praying. And I looked at him and I said, well, sir, uh, I don't know what has happened in your life and how you have come to this kind of a thing in your life. But I do know this. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And he loves you so much. And he would love for you to give your life to, G to him. And the man pulled over onto the shoulder, literally began to weep, buckets of tears of weeping, and, and, and just sharing from deep in his heart how much he had drifted away from the Lord and that kind of thing and and I, I I said I said well is it okay if I pray with you before I get out he said oh yes please do and while I prayed for him he was weeping the whole time uh, and that whole trip was worth that one thing right there that whole trip Almost frostbite, it was still worth it. It was the whole thing was amazing, and it was, I could just tell you, I could I could stay here at least till one p.m. and tell you stories about what happened on that trip, off the charts. And God knows our struggles. He knows our conflicts. He knows what we're struggling with. He knew these people, and he knew what they were struggling with. And I witnessed to Jay Klein and his brother and his cousin. I tried to, I knew they were Jews, but I thought, i got to help these Jews find the Messiah. And I was a new believer, but I, I definitely told them what I thought I should on the way down. And everybody, oh, yeah, I didn't even tell you the whole story. I got to back this way up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The guy picked me up, okay? The guy that I just told you about picked me up. I, I blew the story. I got to tell you what really happened, what actually, the whole thing. It just came back. He, t he picked me up at this exit. I was close to this, this on-ramp, and he went about one, I think, one to the second on-ramp. And he says, well, hey, I got to get off here. You need to get out. I got out. I walked for another hour. Between, he, 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 I, he let me out so quick. He said, oh, I got to get out. Blah, 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 I got to go. Blah, blah, blah. And I got out and I, set, and I got my suitcase out of the back of his truck. And I was standing there and he drove up. And the Holy Spirit said, I thought you were going to witness to everybody about me. You didn't tell him about me. I go, oh, that's right. He was in such a hurry. I just jumped out and I forgot to tell him about Jesus. I walked for a solid hour in that, in that blizzard praying for God to bring him back up on that freeway so I could witness to him. I asked God to forgive me because I had broke my promise. I had promised God. A, and, and a solid hour later, he came back up and picked me up. And that's when I got to witness to him. That's real. That's the real deal right there. And, and so I praise God for that. Uh, and I'll be looking. I, I, did, I didn't even, I don't think I even got his name, but I know if he's in heaven, somebody's going to introduce him to me. And somebody is Jesus. Or maybe his angel. So God knows what we're going through. Oh, yeah, another promise I claimed that whole four hours that I was walking through that blizzard for four hours, freezing to death at night. It was all at night. I claimed Romans 28 all the way through that blizzard. You gotta be, you gotta be claiming God's promises if you're in the middle of that kind of a situation. 
So God knows what we're going through in our life for him. We're living for him. He knows what we're going through. The promises. Oh, Romans 8, 28, well, there's a few Bibles out there. It's kind of one of those things. They'll appreciate it more if I make them look it up, right? Does anybody know what Romans 8, 28 is? If you know what Romans 8, 28 is, stand up and recite it right now. Any brave soul? Here's one. Read it. Turn around. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. There you go. Tell them. Well, I hope I have the right one. Romans 8, 28, I believe, is all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Say, say it again. Loud. All things work together for good for those who are called or the called according to his purpose. Amen. Those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purposes. So, you know, there's some conditions there. In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. You've got to first love the Lord for all things to work together for your good. Now, how hard is it to love God? It's really, the devil makes it as hard as he can, but it's really easy to love God. Right? All you've got to do is, 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 is close your eyes and, re, and remember what happened to Jesus on the cross. And you say, oh, how, how can I not love him? Okay? So, for all... All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. There's one place in the Bible where the Bible uses the word purpose. It says this, for this purpose, Jesus Christ was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He didn't come to destroy the devil, although the devil will be destroyed when Jesus comes to destroy all the things that are evil and the devil is locked in that. He's going to be destroyed. But 1 John 3, 8, if you are dedicated to the purpose of destroying evil out of people's lives, that promise is for you. And you destroy evil out of people's lives with the agape love of Jesus Christ and with the faith of Jesus Christ, with the wisdom of Jesus Christ, the skill and the ability of Jesus Christ. That's how you destroy evil out of people's lives. So there's two conditions for everything to work for your good, good and bad. That's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he is worthy. And even if you don't know how to do that, he will teach you, and then he'll give you the power to do it. All you have to do is want it, desire this Love relationship with the creator of the universe. Think about it. The most intelligent being in the history of the universe. The, the, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of game you're going to play. If you have Jesus on your team, you cannot even lose unless he says, we're going to let them win this time so that they won't feel bad or something like that. You know. I mean, how can you beat Jesus unless he wants you to beat him? At Monopoly. I don't think we're going to be playing Monopoly up there. But when we play Monopoly up there, I can just see Jesus. I can just see him creating new money and slipping it over underneath my deal. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. You know, you read the Bible and these songs just jump out at you. Do not fear. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Fear not, boom, boom, boom. For I am with you. Fear not, boom, boom, boom. For I am with you. Fear not, boom, boom, boom. For I am with you, says the Lord. I have redeemed you. I have called you my own. Child, you are mine. When you walk through the flood, you'll not be drowned. Through the fire and not be burned. You'll not be drowned. You'll not be burned. For I am with you. I think that's it. Isaiah 40, 43, something like that. You know, when we read the Bible, when you read the Bible... Songs will just jump out at you. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit wants you to sing. 
The Holy Spirit wants you to praise and rejoice in God, in the Lord. That's all. And you find these guys doing that. You find Isaiah, but he's right along. And all of a sudden, he's in a praise song. Oh, I guess Isaiah decided to take a break. He's going to sing a praise song. You read the Apostle Paul, he's in prison, chained up in the middle of the night, and he takes a break, and he has a praise chorus, choir, concert. It's amazing. John, book of John, Revelation, he's going through seeing the most incredible revelation in the history of the universe, and all through the book of Revelation, he stops in the middle of it, and all of a sudden, he's singing with the 24 elders, or he's singing with all these angels, or the four creatures, or whatever. And he, it's amazing. Your life a life following Jesus includes a lot of singing. Amen. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. God is saying the very same thing to the people, the Christians in India and Afghanistan and Iraq and wherever they're being persecuted and martyred. He's saying that to them right now. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to to suffer. Nobody knows when it's going to come here. We know it's going to come. We don't know when. I guess the waiting and the wondering is part of the torture for us humans. I had a friend, an uh, elderly man, tell me, you know, dying's really not that bad. It's, 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 it's getting there that really wears you out. I thought, well, that's pretty profound. <laughs> Fear none of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to take over the entire planet. Every nation will wonder after the beast. Every political government and every organized religious leader and religion will be pulled right into the devil's web. There will be no one conducting business of denominational paychecks. And, uh, a while ago, somebody said, uh, oh, I can't remember now what it was about a paid pastors. We need more paid pastors. Actually, we need more lay pastors. And I'm longing for the day when we, own, we don't have any paid pastors. Because that's the time of trouble. You can't buy or sell unless you worship the beast. So if you're a paid pastor during the time of trouble, you better run and get unpaid real quick. Did anybody catch what I just said? And if you're not ready, if you're not, if you're not understanding that that's where God's leading us, then you need to get that understanding real quick. You can't... You, 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 you can't even have a pay phone. You can't even have a cell phone that you pay. How are you going to, you can't buy or sell. Don't worry about the devil tracking you down with your cell phone on the time of trouble. Just stop paying your bills because you won't be able to buy or sell. And they'll shut your cell phone off and then you can throw it in the lake unless you can throw it in the lake before they shut it off. You know, when you're driving down the road, the Lord can talk to you about this kind of stuff. Say, so don't worry about the cell phone. Who cares if they're tracking you everywhere you go? Maybe they'll follow you to a Bible study. I've had him tell me that. He said, who cares who's, who's bugging your internet and your Zoom? Or whatever? Who cares if they're all listening to what you're saying? He says, you should hope and pray that they're listening to what you're saying on the Zoom or on your uh, cell phone. Amen. The righteous, David says in Psalm, I think it's 107, 107, the righteous are as bold as lions, but the wicked flee when no one's even chasing them. They run, they're scared of their shadows. He said the righteous are as bold as lions. Hopefully they won't eat you up like lions, but they're as bold as lions. Fear not, for I am with you. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And it's God authorizing it. The devil can't throw anyone in prison. He can't throw any Christian in prison without God authorizing it, the same as he authorized the devil to do things to Job, only this time it's going to be worldwide. That you may be tested. 
And Job was tested. And he came through shining like gold at the end. And you will have tribulation. And tribulation produces gold character. Romans 5 talks about that. Ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Isn't that awesome? Be faithful until death. And all we have to be able to say, and he'll give you the power to say it, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. As you're dying. If you die before Jesus comes, ask the Holy Spirit to remind you to say that before you died, or something like it, something else you could find in the Bible that's similar to that, but it needs to be something like that. Jesus, save me. That's the same thing. Jesus, I, I, I'll see you in the morning. That's a good one, too. Or I'll, Jesus, I'll be, I'll be waiting for the alarm. I know you're going to blow that trumpet. I've heard most preachers will tell you that Gabriel's the one going to blow the trumpet, but I, I got a debate going on with that. I, I may be wrong, and that's fine. I don't, not a big deal. But it says the trumpet of the Lord. I believe that Jesus owns this trumpet. It's his trumpet. And, it, it, and the grammar sets itself up. The Lord himself, it's not only grammar, it's, 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 uh, it's actually accented, accentuated. It's emphasized. It doesn't say just the Lord is going to come. It says the Lord himself in person is going to descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel. Who's the archangel? Michael. That's the name of Jesus before he became a human when he was leading the angel armies. We'll descend with heaven with the voice of the archangel. There's only one archangel in the universe. A lot of people think Gabriel's an archangel. No, he's not. There's only one archangel in the Bible. And that's the one who is like the Father, Michael. Completely. There's so much alike that in Daniel 7, the Ancient of Days, the Father, he comes first to set up the court in heaven. And then, and then one who looks just like the Father comes, and the Father gives all the judgment over to the second one, which is the Son of God. It's amazing that the, the Trinity, the three who have united as one, are all through the Bible. And you'll actually find all three of them there in Daniel 7 as well. I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who, he who wants to hear. This how, you know how easy it is to have an ear? You can have your ears cut off and still have an ear. Reminds me of when Peter cut that guy's ear off. Wow, what a guy Peter must have been. Whew. Swinging a sharp sword like that. You can just see it. He was trying to take his head off. I mean, Peter was reckless. He wasn't going for his ear. I can just see Peter coming like this, and the guy ducks, and shoo. There goes his ear. And Jesus is so awesome. The guy's coming to arrest Jesus, to put him through a, a mockery criminal trial. I mean, the people conducting the trial were the criminals, not Jesus. They're going to put him through a, a mockery illegal trial. And they're going to nail him to a, They're going to spit on him. They're going to tear the beard off his face. That's what that guy's coming to do to Jesus. And Jesus bends down, gets the ear, and just takes out some super glue. And if you believe that, you need to read your Bible a little more. He didn't need super glue. All he needed was himself. He, all he needed was love, because he is love. And love is what melted that thing back on there. And I guarantee you, the guy probably heard better out of that ear than his other ear for the rest of his life. I may be wrong on that, but I'll be checking when I get home. And I'm not talking about home here. I'm talking about home on the sea of glass. I'll be finding out. I'm going to find that guy. Chances of him being in heaven are really high. 
You don't get your ear cut off and have some guy walk up and put it back up and say, I love you and, and, I, and I hope you I hope you can give your life to me someday. I don't know what else he said to the guy, but he probably was whispering, can you hear me now? I love you. I don't know what he did. John says if everything was written down that Jesus said and did, the world wouldn't be able to hold the books. I think there's a, I think he had an opportunity to whisper a few nice things to his ear as he was plugging it back on. And it wasn't testing, testing, testing. That's, Jesus used every moment to communicate, I love you. I want you with me in heaven. So you got an ear. You want to hear? Well, I tell you, little Samuel, he wanted to hear. Three times he's confused and he thinks it's Eli. Fourth time, he heard God call his name and he says, Speak, Lord, for I want to hear what you have to say. That's basically what he said. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, because I really want to hear what you have to say. You alone have the words of eternal life. That's what the disciples would tell Jesus 1,200 years later. 1,100 years later. He said, are you also going to go back and stop following me? He says, where can we go, Master? You only have, you're the only one that has the words of eternal life. And guess what? That happened. It's the, it's the saddest, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. It's John 6, verse 66. It's John 6, 6, 6. One of, it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. And I know that a God who was watching over when those guys put chapters and verses in here, I don't believe that happened by accident. I just don't believe that stuff. It's one of the longest chapters in the Bible. Got to have a lot of verses to get 66. Well, no one, I'm looking for John 6, 66 in Luke 6, and it's kind of hard to find there in Luke 6. So I'll look for it in John 6. Some of you already beat me there, I hope. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him never again. That's what's going to happen in the time of trouble. Many who once rejoiced in the light and the truth of our Lord and his gospel are going to sell their souls out for, for soup for porridge, just like Esau did. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Verse 67, Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? There's nowhere else to go. There's nobody else. You alone have the words of eternal life. He who has an ear, he who wants to hear, will hear the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He who overcomes, see, there's conditions here, there's conditions to salvation. God's love is unconditional. He loves everybody, period, no conditions. But only those who respond to God in the positive affirmations that the Word of God clearly spells out, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. They that receive Him, He gave power to be the sons of God. There's a condition. You meet these conditions, you live forever. And it's simply a choice. Overcoming is a choice. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And you got you to know where the dots go on this. It's not talking about works here. This overcoming deal is not about works. It's, it's, it's look at 1 John 5, 1 John 5, 1 John 5. Somebody says, why is this guy always harping about studying your Bible every day? Because if you don't have the word of God protecting you, you're going down.
1 John 5. Anytime you find the word overcome in the Bible, you should put 1 John 5 right there until you got it burned into your memory. But until you get it burned in your memory, you should write it down somewhere where you can see it every time you read the word overcomers. He who overcomes, 1 John 5, 3. He who overcomes, to those who overcome, 1 John 5, 3. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Did you have any choice about being born as a baby when you were born as a baby? No. You do have a choice about this birth. All you can do is choose Jesus. Say, Jesus, I want this, and boom, he'll give it to you. You don't jump high enough to get it. You don't run fast enough to get it. You don't get smart enough to get it. You just say, yes, Lord, I want it. Boom, done. Whatever is born again, whatever is born of God, that's John 3, Nicodemus, that whole thing. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith, it's not our works, it's our faith. And if my faith is the faith of Jesus, my works will improve with each passing day. They will grow and mature and experience God's leadership and God's mentorship and God's training. And my works will improve even if it looks like they're getting worse. God causes all things to work for my good, even my mistakes. If I dedicate my life to loving Jesus Christ and to destroying the works of evil, he uses even my mistakes for my good and his glory. He said all things work for my good. Don't get discouraged about making mistakes. Get Jesus on your mistakes with Romans 8.28. Our faith is what overcomes this world, not our works. Our works will improve. Our works will bring attention to Jesus, but they can never save us. They can get other people to think about Jesus. When they see our good works, they will glorify our Father in heaven. Our works can cause people to ask questions about Jesus, cause people to, to think about Jesus. But our works can never change us. Our works can never save us. Who is he who overcomes the world? Here's how easy it is. He who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's the same word that's in John 3, 16. He who believeth in him should not perish. You believe in Jesus so much that you don't ever want to be anywhere without him. Oh, I don't have time for that. We're just going to, I'll have to preach that on November 13. Wow, I forgot all that. That's a whole other sermon. There's no way in the world I'm going to have time for that. But I got time for that. Satan says, here's what Satan will tell you. Stuff like this. You have disappointed God too many times. Just forget it. Give up. Here's what God says. I knew everything you would do before you were born. And I still called you. And I still went to the cross for you. I knew everything you were going to do, and I still went to the cross for you. That's what Jesus said. I'm not finished with you. Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6. You know, I think I've just worn this thing out. It takes two or three clicks to get it to move now. So, well, either work a miracle or get a new one, right? What is Jesus saying to me? Wow. First thing that comes to my mind is, Paul, I love you so much, and I want you with me forever. And I can get you there. That's what I hear Jesus telling me every day. And if he wasn't telling me every day, if he wasn't saying stuff like that to me every day, I would be really messed up. I would be so nervous and discouraged and worried and confused. He's telling me, Paul, I love you so much, and I want you with me forever. That's what he tells me every day. He 
knows my name. We're going to sing this song. One day I was singing it. And, I, and I, this happens to me a lot. But I, I sing these songs and they're way too short. They need more verses. You know, they need, they need more verses, you know. And so I added a verse to this one. So if it's, if it's a little weird for you guys, don't worry about it. But I did add this last verse. And uh, actually the Lord did because he knows I wanted another verse. <laughs> and he gives us the desires of our heart, right? I mean, seriously, if you want to praise God with one more verse in a song, don't you know he's going to give you one more verse? He's awesome. Let's stand and sing. He knows my name. Thank you, Don, for being such an awesome soldier and playing that piano for us every Sabbath. Let's, let's sing. Oh, wait a minute. Esper, Esper, you got to get up here. Go ahead and play some. You know, it's really true. Jesus said, the man will leave his family and the wife, woman will leave her family and they become one. That's so awesome. Isn't that awesome? And I don't feel complete unless she's up here singing with me like that because she covers up all my stuff, my bad stuff. Okay. I, he knows my name. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Jesus. He definitely doesn't want you to leave without him. What he really wants is for you to open your heart and just say yes. Say yes, Jesus. I want you and I need you. Come into my life and save me for your glory. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the risen Savior of the world, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you 
his peace and joy and wisdom and love and goodness and mercy all the days of your life. And as you go forth, may everyone around you just be infected with his glory because you are overflowing according to his word, overflowing with him. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go.